blessing it is to know that God doesn't grow weary. There are so many moments in life where we are exhausted, where we are worn out. This week, uh, my family was absolutely just, we had a blast in Pigeon Forge, but we were exhausted, exhausted. There was nothing left to give. Thank God that that is not the case with God. That God's mercy is always there. God's grace is always with us. And God's love is everlasting and steadfast. When we are weary, God is strong. When we are weak, Christ is strong. When we are in need of hope and help, God sends his spirit to us. Thank God for God. Let us pray. Lord, as we sing these songs, help us to worship you, to seek your will for our lives, to be refreshed, to be 
made new in this moment, in this place, to have new life breathed into our lungs. God, fill this place with your spirit. Fill our hearts with your truth. Speak to us. Be with us. Be the everlasting God, the giver of new life. Go with us. This we pray in your name.
in week three of a series today, week three of a series called Easter Peeps. I still got my peep here, and uh, I had had someone stop by the church Friday, and I walked them in here in the sanctuary, and they, they looked at it, and they were like, what goes on in this place? You know, it had that look about it, but we're in a series called Easter Peeps, and it's not like the candy, the popular candy, the peeps, but peeps also refers to people, people that are part of your life or maybe a friend or an acquaintance and as we look to God's word as we as we look at the greatest story that's ever told the story of the uh, of the gospel message how Jesus makes his way onto this earth as a child and then walks this life for 30 some years giving few years to ministry full-time ministry we see that it leads to holy week which is his betrayal and his ultimately his death and and resurrection as we uh, will, will, will culminate on Easter Sunday. But there's so many people that played a role in the Easter story, and that's the peeps we're referring to. Some of them that you maybe are very aware of. We know of Jesus' role, and we'll get to him. And there are others, like Mary, that we will think of. And there are others like Judas, who we've talked about. And Barabbas, who we talked about last week. And then there are some that maybe you don't even remember their names or maybe not even can pronounce their names, as we'll see today. But we started out with Judas a couple of weeks ago. We're hitting all the villains first, if, we, if you will. All right, every, every good story's got a good guy and a bad guy, right? That's what makes millions of dollars for movies. There's a good guy and a bad guy. And so there, there's villains in this story because it's not a pretty story until the end. Let's just face it. There's, there's a lot that goes bad. There's a lot of negativity in this story. And Judas is one of those, Judas Iscariot, and he was chosen by Christ to be one of his closest followers, his disciples, learning from him, walking with him in ministry. And, and yet, despite all that, for 30 pieces of silver, he turned his back on him and betrayed him handing him over to the authorities. What started by him just taking a little bit of money out of the, the money bag as the treasurer of the bunch led to sin setting in. You see, this is just not a one-time thing that he did. The nature of sin is such that Judas's fall was not just one bad decision, but that sin had gotten deep down into his spirit and into his life, and like gravity, it pulled him down doing something that you wouldn't think a close follower of Jesus would be capable of, capable of doing. And yet he did it. And last week this, we discussed another character from the Easter story, one who according to Scripture, or, or at least in Scripture, never spoke a word. We never hear from Barabbas in this story. And yet he plays a major role because he is, has done so much wrong in his life and deserved the punishment that was due to him for his actions. He was a murderer, an insurrectionist. 
However, Christ became his substitute, as we talked about last week, and died on the cross in his place. And if we have any little bit of understanding of the gospel message, which I know you do, then we all understand that each of us are Barabbas. We're all Barabbas. Maybe you haven't murdered anybody, but you have always been in need since the day you were born of a substitute. For the sin that was that that was was a part of your life when you came into this world. So today we're introducing another peep from the gospel story, and we're looking a little farther back. This is in no particular chronological order. We're looking a little bit back in the story to the first and probably the worst of the bad guys. The first and the worst of the bad guys is what I would call him. Judas and Barabbas make the list of villains in this story. Caiaphas leads the way. That's a fun name to say. Caiaphas. Like Judas, you don't know anybody named Caiaphas. Because who wants to be remembered as such? John 11. Gospel of John, chapter 11, verse 45. It's on the screen. It's also in your Bible. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Who can tell me what did Jesus do? Anybody remember? All you got to do is... All you got to do is look in your Bible a couple of verses back. He raised Lazarus from the dead. I'll give it away. Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead, his dear, dear friend. He's performed many miracles. He's done many teachings. He's said things that rub the religious folks the wrong way. But now, oh, you've really done it, Jesus. You know, given restoring sight to the blind, making the lame whole again, healing someone of leprosy, Turning water into wine, okay, those are great miracles. But you have really done it here. Because you just showed how divine you really are. You have taken a man who has died and brought him back to life. And the Bible says that the people, many of them, uh, believed in him, and they that some of them went back and tattled. Y'all didn't read that? That's what happened. Hey, they went back and tattled to the fair. Did y'all see what Jesus did? Did you hear about it? Oh, he has done it now. He is now raising people from the dead. Is he some God? Is he the God? And, 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 and despite the fact they knew that the Messiah was coming, Verse 47, then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. I mean, if this doesn't sound like modern day life we're living in, I don't know what does. Because you, somebody comes to you and says, hey, we got a problem. All of a sudden, we got to have a meeting. We got to talk about this. Let's put our minds together and figure out what we do next. The Bible says, what are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. Listen, Here, here's what they're saying will be the results if they continue to let him go on about his business. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and and our nation. You think they feel a little threatened here. These religious authorities, the temple authorities, are threatened by this one individual. Verse 49, then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, he spoke up. He said, you know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you. Listen, listen at the option he gives them here. Listen at what he proposes. 
He says, you do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. They've had their meeting. He's made his sales pitch. Here's what happens. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. May God have his blessing to his word. That was when it happened. That's when it all began. When it was initiated. Someone who initiates something is often known as an instigator, right? My parents like to call me an instigator. I don't understand what they're talking about. You know I was raised with two brothers. I was the middle. How many, how many middle children we got? Anybody get a middle child? Okay, we, okay. We, y'all know. Y'all know. You're the middle child. You're not the oldest you know, you weren't the first. You're not the baby. You just squeezed there in the middle somewhere. So I became the instigator, Junior. I couldn't always defend myself against the older one. And I wasn't allowed to touch the younger one. So I just pit them against one another. My mom would always say, I've mentioned this before. If there was just two of you boys together, you were fine. But when the third one comes in the picture, why y'all shaking y'all's head? Y'all act like you know me. You know the situation. You know the situation. I still make light and jokes about being an instigator sometimes. I do it when I crack jokes with people. I'll start something. I'll get something going. Well, that's who this guy was. But at a different level. Caiaphas was this. He was definitely this instigator. He started the plot to kill Jesus of Nazareth, the son of God. Now you know why nobody names their kids Caiaphas. This is who he was. But you also got to see that he was this schemer. He was scheming this plan. He came up with this plan to kill Jesus and he was the one that was showing the others how they should bring Jesus down and why they should bring him down. He is the high priest, folks. He is the religious authority. He's this high priest, that, that the most powerful religious leader among the Jewish people. His job was to be the person between them and, and God. He was the one that was responsible for teaching the people and knowing the scriptures and studying them and relaying them and even talking to them about the Messiah who was to come. Think about that a moment. Caiaphas, was his role as high priest was to tell them about the coming Messiah that's prophesied back in the Old Testament. That's part of his role. He was supposed to show them how to recognize him when he comes. And he was anything but that kind of example to them. You see, he was appointed to this position. Caiaphas' role as the high priest was a little different because he was appointed to this position, not by the rules and the rights written down in God's holy word, but rather by the governor, a previous governor before Pilate. He was appointed because he did favors. And y'all just thought we dealt with crooked democracy. <laughs> no, anywhere you got people, you got crooks. Let's just face it. It started way back then. Caiaphas wasn't the person for the job. But he had done all of this and, and he had gotten to this place of affluence and influence. A position that he used in any and every way to ensure that he kept power and prestige. And Caiaphas liked his power and he would do anything. He would turn on 
anyone to see that it wasn't taken away from him. I don't talk politics from this pulpit, but I'll give you a good example. Anytime we have a political season, what happens among those who are running for office? They begin to run each other down. They begin to go and find dirt. All of these candidates, they go, they they do commercials not as much about what they're going to bring to the table, but what others' agendas are if you vote them into office. Then they have these debates on television or these public debates that you can go and attend. And what do they do? They spend these couple of hours just tearing each other down. Why? Because they have their own agenda. And if I can make people not trust your agenda, then maybe, just maybe, you'll follow mine. And this is why Caiaphas acted out in this situation. He knows that he's going to lose everything if he allows Jesus to continue in his ministry. Jesus is doing all these miracles. He's going around and helping people. He's making this big difference. He's he's feeding people physically, miraculously, and also spiritually. He's teaching them the the word of God and the way of, of, of the Lord. And he's getting this big following that rivals anything else that's going on in the country. And as people start to hear and learn from Jesus, they start to understand that what they've been told by the temple authorities and even the high priest Caiaphas is not really adding up. The people are learning that truths and promises of God are really exposing the corruption and the greed that's taking place among the religious leaders. You see, they were being challenged they were being threatened and Caiaphas saw that he was losing on two fronts because Jesus is building up this followership of people and he's speaking truth he's got all these individuals starting to follow him take their eyes off of them the religious ones and focusing it on the truth And Caiaphas was desperate in this moment to get Jesus gone quickly. He realized that he had to fight back. Jesus has already gone into the temple and tossed out the money changers and the marketers. He's shown his anger. He's gone in there and caused disruption in the temple. He's preached openly about the lies and the corruption of the religious authority. And even Rome was beginning to notice Jesus of Nazareth. They were taking notice of him, and that meant that Rome was starting to watch Caiaphas really closely and question whether or not he might be the right person for the job. You see, this was something that Caiaphas had already been planning, scheming in his mind. It wasn't just the, the, the resurrection of Lazarus that did it. But he realized in that moment, something happened in that moment that he realized, number one, we got to call a meeting. Number two, this is, my, this is my chance. This is my moment when I can scheme against how to put a stop to this. We're going to lose the temple. We're going to lose this whole nation. We're going to lose our followers. We're going to lose those who, who give. <laughs> How could, I look back to Judas and I think of Caiaphas. How could someone be so corrupt? It's really hard to believe that someone that has all the scripture available to him could be so corrupt. He has studied God's word inside and out as it's been given to him. And it's his responsibility to teach that word. It's my responsibility to teach you the word of God as your pastor. Here's the difference. You've got your own Bible. It's the same Bible. 
they didn't have their own Bible back then. They didn't have it on a screen or on their phone or laying in their house. It wasn't available to them. They were dependent upon the high priest to teach them the word of God. So how can someone who has this responsibility turn his back on the truth? Caiaphas was denying and turning his back on the truth of scripture. And the really painful part of all of this is we sit back and we watch as churches and the church and Christians and pastors do the same. They turn their back on the truth. I'm not speaking specifically to a church or a group or an individual or anybody sitting here today, but it happens. And it's happening more and more and more. Why? Because we're faced with conflict. And we're faced with, as the church with having to make a decision. Do we take a stand? Or do we let them push us around? Do we stand for what's right and what's true and what's holy and what's evident in Scripture as being the absolute truth of God? Or do we be people pleasers and just kind of well, we just won't mention it. You see, there are churches out there today that have decided they're just going to kind of steer away from truth because they don't want to offend anybody. They're afraid they'll lose their church. They'll lose their givers. They'll lose the people that are supporting the church. They'll lose those who are serving in the church. They'll make somebody mad and then they'll leave the church. That's the world we live in. That is the world we live in. Pastors are doing the same thing. And yet I stand here and refuse to say anything but the truth. That should get a couple of people excited. Apparently nobody cares, so I'll just say what I want. I'm being funny. I refuse to share anything but the truth of God. I may not stand up here and share my thoughts on certain topics or agendas or cultural matters. But if you ask me, I'm going to tell you. And that's why nobody ever asked me. I will love on anybody. I will accept anybody. I will pray with anybody. I'll hug anybody. We'll welcome anybody. But we'll also love you so much that we'll tell you what the truth is. And anything less is not love. It's selfishness. And Caiaphas was selfish. He didn't want the people to know the truth. He knew that just like we do that the truth would set them free. And he didn't want their freedom. Caiaphas pushed aside the teachings of God's word for his own good. The real truth is like Caiaphas, people try to kill God and get him out of their way sometimes. That's powerful. So they can pursue their own goals and their own priorities. The evils of Caiaphas are so alive and prevalent in our world today. Even in our churches. But only the truth of God's word is going to get a grip on the evil and wickedness that is pervading our culture. Only the truth. Not some fancy speech. Not some nice blog or article that's written. Only speaking the truth is going to do it. And the truth is not easy to speak at times because we know it's not easy to hear. Well, I just won't say anything because I don't want to make anybody upset. 
If you have people in your life who are dealing with matters that are spiritual concerns and they're not living according to God's word, it is your responsibility to speak up. Regardless of how they might look at you afterwards. Otherwise, you let them continue to live in the pit of sin and evil that they're in, that the enemy has gotten them in until it eventually claims their life and soul. And whose blood are their, is on, who, who, whose hands are their blood on then? I know that's deep. I know that's strong. But it's our duty, it's the duty of the church to take a firm stand on the absolute truths of God's word and what thus saith the Lord. Caiaphas would not be denied his position. So he plotted to shut Jesus down. He would get rid of him no matter what the cost. He called this meeting with the Sanhedrin council and they met together to determine what they should do to shut him up. And Caiaphas came up with this plan, a plan that would solve everyone's problems. You see, the problem was the council was too afraid to act. They eventually, they knew they couldn't do anything. They, they couldn't send down a judgment of execution against Jesus. They didn't have that authority. Pontius Pilate did the governor, the judge Caiaphas addressed the council and he chose his words rightly I want you to hear what I just said he's a schemer he chose his words rightly in other words he knew exactly what to say to convince them that this was the right decision. And they may not have ever seen it coming, Linda. They're the religious leaders. None of us are exempt from being, having our faith, our belief system, our stance attacked. And even twisted. It is important that we stand on the truth of God's word and God's word alone. He looked at them and said, hey, you can have one man and his life or you can watch a whole nation perish. Which is it going to be? He knew. He gave them an, an option, a choice, an ultimatum. I mean, any of us sitting here would be like, hey, let's sacrifice that one. Because we don't want to lose the whole nation and our temple and our, our government and what we have is what we've worked so hard for. He had this rhetoric and this speech that just twisted their minds and gave them this choice. And they, they chose the one man. Let's sacrifice him. You see, that's the irony in this whole story. With Caiaphas here and the religious folk. They believed that the death of Jesus would save them. When in fact, the death of Jesus could save them. The death of Jesus could save them and they didn't even realize it. Even though they were experts in the in the word they were experts in the the holy scriptures the messiah is right in front of their eyes Caiaphas was using this evil plan to plan something that God would turn into something wonderful you've heard it said what the enemy meant for evil well, God turned it for good. Caiaphas spoke his words as a villain, a betrayer, a schemer. And God took the words that were shared by Caiaphas, the plan, the scheme that he had in place, 
to fulfill prophetic promise. To see to it that Jesus was the last and ultimate sacrificial lamb. Caiaphas had murder on his mind and God had salvation in his plan. What's crazy is that the words the words that led to the execution of Jesus the overthrow of Jesus himself was exactly the fulfillment of prophecy. Because he said, this one man, this one man can be sacrificed for the people. That's what we just read. And that's exactly what happened. The fulfillment of prophecy, Junior, came to pass. And Jesus died for the people everyone standing this morning a couple of practical applications for you here today you've seen the first one it's very clear protect yourself protect yourself here your pastor Ooh, the world's tugging, the world's pulling, the world's trying to trick and deceive. We have to take a stand. We have to take a stand. We cannot be swayed or persuaded. We can't, we can't allow ourselves to, to, to put our, the truth of God and what we stand for on the line. We have to take a stand. And that means preaching truth. Preaching truth. We were at this conference this week. And there there was a speaker that was speaking and he was talking about all that we've gone through in the last couple of years and through the pandemic and how that's affected the church and pastors and leaders in the church and even even the church Christians and he said something about he said you know you at some point you as pastors have probably over the last couple of years had to get up and preach about cultural issues that are going on and I've done a little bit of that I hit on it sometimes but the way he was conveying it and I don't necessarily disagree with him I know it's happened it's just not always the stance that I take as a pastor I don't think it's my job necessarily to come in here and just, hey, let's unpack this cultural issue that's going on. I think it's my job to preach the truth. That's what God has called me to do. And if he gives me direction, Linda, and speaks to me and helps me to have the words to convey something that will give you clarity in a certain situation, then great. But it's more about preaching truth and helping you walk a life of holiness in Him so that you live this life of holiness close to God, near and dear to Him. And when these issues come to your front door, you know how to handle them. You know how to address them. You know what God has put in your heart through His Word and through your time spent with Him in prayer. You see, the issue was Jesus came in speaking truth. Caiaphas didn't like it. He was the voice of what was truth. And it caused a concern and an issue. And so his plot played out, but something wonderful came out of it when Jesus died for us all, every one of us.